Everybody, Jimmy Smith, UFC 246, post-fight breakdown. Once again, did the Sirius XM show till 3 in the morning. A lot of fun with RJ Clifford. So, anyway, uh, the first thing I want to talk about is something I tweeted about during the show that maybe a lot of people don't know or aren't aware of or familiar with. The pay-per-view has a certain window they have to meet contractually. If, if the show ends before that, they have to fill time. It doesn't matter. So, in this case, it's 10 p.m. Western, uh, 1 p.m. Eastern. They have to go to that point. So, whenever you see an early stoppage in the first couple fights, you're going to start seeing a bunch of video packages. So, they have to fill that time, either way. And they don't know how long the final fight's going to go. So, usually in the middle of the card is when you start seeing all these videos. And a lot of people went, well, why are they showing commercials for a fight I'm already seeing? Why are they uh, showing Wayne and stuff? And they're dumping all their video packages and pieces in order to, hey, sweetheart, in order to um, fill up time. Because the show has to go three hours, period, end of sentence. Now, there's a back end window, too. Uh, famously, it was a WCW pay per view with Diamond Dallas Page and, and Goldberg, and they went too long, which is insane because it's predetermined. And suddenly, as Diamond Dallas Page is warming up, and Goldberg, the show ended. Boop, window's over. They'll just cut you off. So there's a window of time that you have to get to, and you can't go past. And it might vary a little bit depending on the pay-per-view, but you have to do it. So that's that explains a couple of things to, to people that were frustrated about why they're showing commercials for a fight you're already watching, is because they just need to dump all that video stuff to fill time. Why don't they show fights, previous fights? They used to do that a lot more. And I know in Bellator, we used to do it all the time. The problem is the live audience has already seen that fight. And so you have a live crowd in the arena that's watching an old fight on a video that they've already seen, a prelim or something like that. And they get a little restless. So it's a crowd killer. And for a Connor fight where you want them screaming and waving flags, you don't want to bore them for a half hour having them watch a fight they've already seen. So... That's certainly part of it. There might be some other thing with ESPN where they're not allowed to show the prelims because that's an ESPN thing. I don't know. But I know in Bellator, it could be a crowd killer. If you have to show a few of those back-to-back or a couple fights in a row, the, the live crowd just, they start getting bored. So that's why you saw all those commercials and stuff right after fight number two. That's when they start going, oh, crap. You know, we've had, uh, you know, nine minutes of total fighting and we're two fights in. Ugh, you know, we got to fill. One of the few things that me, when I, when I was commentating Bellator and, and many Rodriguez, the um, Spanish commentator, we would sit there with the producer and kind of tell him which fights we thought would go long and which would be short. So we could kind of make the skeleton of where to put in video stuff. Sometimes we're right, sometimes we're wrong, but that's, it's a useful guide. And so anyway, they had two quick finishes right off the bat and the third one wasn't that long either. So they had to use all those packages. Anyway, moving on to the fight itself. Uh, going over my picks, what I got right, what I got wrong. Carlos Diego Fajeda over Anthony Pettis. I picked Pettis. I thought he would counter-strike and do well. And that's what it looked like in the beginning. Fajeda coming forward and Pettis kind of playing the matador and backing up and, and doing well in the beginning. And then when it went to the ground, it was all Fajeda. Easy back takes. Easy stuff. Dominance, passing guard easily. And Pettis had shown a good guard up to this point. And so some really solid submission skills, but... The fundamental positioning stuff was all Fajeda. And then, uh, for the finish of the fight, it looked like a half crank, half choke. I mean, uh, the audio that replayed, I don't listen to the audio when I'm when I'm studying a fight, but then when I got on air for a series, they were replaying some of it. And I don't think anybody thought he was going to finish right there. You know, it caught Joe by surprise. He was... It just seemed like kind of a half crank, half choke. He was kind of turning to his side. Usually, you're out at that point, or you at least resist the choke, and... Fajeda was all over him. So great performance by Fajeda over Pettis. It's the first, as I said last night, uh, I don't know if you guys follow me on Twitter, but I, I, I said it's the first really non marquee name to beat him. Um, you go back to Clay Guida. Clay Guida at the time was at least a, a tough guy, and it was it was um, Pettis' UFC debut. But, you know, over the last few years, the only guys to beat Pettis have really been top shelf, and, and Fajeda ran through him. Now, Fajeda might be better than everybody thought. It's possible. I'm saying in name value. Uh, Fajeda was the first kind of like guy that was kind of under the radar to to beat him and 
Didn't just beat him. He ran through him. Great performance. Brian Gallagher, uh, Odie Osborne. Gallagher just owned him. Big, huge takedown. That's always a bad sign right in the beginning. Not just a takedown, but a woom. Up, you know, double leg where the guy's in the air, and that was immediate. And Odie Osborne just didn't have an answer to get out of that. And that was a wicked guillotine choke. Anytime you have to tap with your foot because your arm's trapped and you're going out, that's that's a hell of a choke. So Brian Kelleher running right through Ode Osborne first round, 2 minutes, 49 seconds. Great stuff for him. They just added that to the main card, so I didn't make a prediction on that one um, uh, in my video before because it wasn't on the main card. Alexi Olenek, Maurice Green. I picked Alexi Olenek by submission. He won by submission. Uh, second round. And... A lot of different ground transitions, and Alexi Olenek just tenacious. He had to walk through a lot to get that submission against Maurice Green. He went put everything in that armbar. The thing about the uh, scarf hold position he was in, and somebody online said he was going for an arm triangle choke. The arm triangle is from a slightly different position. This, the, the, the reason for the confusion is the position he was in in wrestling is called head and arm position. In jiu-jitsu, it's generally called scarf hold position. Scarf hold arm lock, scarf hold choke. So what he was going for it was kind of a scarf hold choke where he's got the head in the arm and he's just squeezing and pulling up. That's hard to finish. It really is, even if you're the superior jiu-jitsu guy. It's just a power move. It costs a ton of energy. And if the guy has blue belt jiu-jitsu, you can make the little adjustments that are going to get you out of that. You can just kind of power your way out of it. It's not a clean submission. It's one of those that requires a lot of energy and there isn't a whole lot of reward. And I thought early on in the fight, Alexi Olenek was going for a lot of those things. I mean, just cranking on a dude. That dude's six foot seven. You have to really put a crank on there. And I referenced on Twitter Mark Coleman, Dan Severin was kind of that that kind of thing. Guys may have fallen for that early in the game. They, they don't fall for it that much anymore. And so he's pulling and yanking. And I was like, man, he's 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 giving a lot of energy for no reward. He's not getting the tap, and he is really burning gas. Certain submissions in jiu-jitsu are efficient. They either work or they don't. You know pretty quickly. Guillotine, for example, you got to hold on for a long time, and it can really burn out your arms and your back and shoulders. So that's why with the guillotine, it's kind of, you got to be careful. If you go hard for a guillotine, the guy gets out, and we see it all the time. Guy gets out of the guillotine, and his opponent's just like, Ugh, because it just takes a lot of energy. You don't know for a while. Guys can fight it for a little bit. So you, you might be committing and committing and committing and not getting anything. An armbar, you have it or you don't. You're going to know in a few seconds um, once it's positionally locked in. I want to make that very, very clear. So then he gets the armbar on the ground. Once again, it was it was kind of this position where it looked like Morris Green might be able to push down a leg and step over, and maybe a more experienced guy would have, and he ended up getting caught. And that was really Maurice Green, big, talented, strong, heavyweight, just hadn't shown me so far the ground slickness most decent submission guys at heavyweight, I think, would have gotten out of that armbar. It wasn't a great position for Olenek. You, you try not to finish in that position because it's hard. All the weight's on you. The opponent can just angle over you. It's a hard position to fin finish an armbar. Great job by Alexi Olenek. But it's clear Maurice Green just didn't know how to step the right way to get out of that. Um, but persistent with the submission game. But I thought he was choosing submissions that cost him a lot of gas. And if he didn't finish Maurice Green about when he did, I, I was afraid he was going to be out of gas by the end of round two. But great uh, submission by Alexi Olenek. I thought he won by submission, and he did. Uh, Holly Holm, Raquel Pennington. Not a great fight. Um, but Holly Holm has developed this really disengaging jab, oblique kick, push kick kind of style with a lot of movement. And it's safe, and it wins her rounds. Clearly it did. But only one judge gave Raquel Pennington one round. But, man, it's hard to watch. It's just, you know, the clinch and then the jab. It's, it's, it's safety first. Doesn't commit to any power strikes. Doesn't really change her level on the takedown. And she won a decision, which I thought she would do. I thought she'd win by decision. But what I see in the future is where does Holly Holm go? She's already had enough title shots that I don't think the fans would be that interested in her getting another one. She's shown she really can't beat the elite in her weight class. That's always been her sticking point. She lost to Manny Nunes, she lost to Shevchenko, she lost to uh, Chris Cyborg, lost to Misha Tate, GDR. I mean, no no shame in those losses, but you, you, you just can't get over that hump. She just She's not going to beat a Manny Nunes fighting the way she did against Raquel Pennington. That's not going to happen. And Nunes controls two divisions. So I don't see her, oh, I'll go up or I'll go here. She can't make 25 that I'm aware of. She's pretty big. So she's just, 
I'm going to stay where she is, I guess. Um, it, my my broadcast partner, RJ Clifford, last night said, Holly Holm shows the disparity in the division. Where Holly Holm can beat everybody except the elite fighters. It's almost like she's the borderline. There are great fighters, and then there are kind of the rest. And Holly Holm's kind of in the middle of those. Well, she beats the rest, but she can't beat those elite fighters. And rarely, once again, Uriah Faber is the only other example I can think of of somebody who, against gatekeepers, he always won. Against the elite, he always lost. And you know, it's just, just where she is. The problem is, for her, is Uriah Faber was in a division where she, he could have fun fights against gatekeepers and people would pay money to see it. There aren't a lot of names outside of the elite for Holly Holm to fight. She can fight a lot of them, but it'll be a lot of... You know, UFC fight night stuff, and it's just hard if you're not fighting big names in the women's division. There aren't a lot of other names. Main event: Conor McGregor, Donald Cowboy Cerrone. I'm no genius, okay? Yes, I know the fight game. Yes, I pick Conor McGregor to win early. A lot of people were picking Conor McGregor to win early. I think the smart money was Conor McGregor first two rounds against Donald Cerrone. Even if you're a huge Cerrone fan, you have to admit that was the most likely narrative. Cabo would have to do something, um, I wouldn't say extraordinary, but he'd have to fight really well in the first two rounds to get past those first two rounds, to get into the rounds three, four, and five. Maybe he can start wearing Connor down. Um, it, we didn't see the first minute of the first round. Here is the thing that's going to cause arguments and controversy as long as people talk about this fight. Connor looked great, looked very, very sharp. Crisp punches, accurate, fast start, which we always expect from him. Donald Cerrone looked like the Donald Cerrone that can't get out of second gear in big fights. Now, how much of that is one or the other is a matter of opinion. I know there are no opinions. People that are wrong or right in MMA and the people that are wrong know nothing about MMA. Where you put that is up to you. You can't take away from the fact Connor really did look good. Very sharp, very accurate. Once again, crisp combinations, power, everything you expect from him. Didn't look like the layoff or all these out of octagon issues bothered him. We really learned that. That it wasn't like he was a little like gun shire, his timing was off because it's been a long laugh. Really looked good. Cowboy, last night, once again, RJ Clifford on, on Sirius XM had Compu Strike in front of him. He said, Cowboy was 0 1 with strikes. I didn't see the one strike he threw. He just didn't throw. And I had people get mad at me for, I, I tweeted out, you know, God, Cowboy just looked like a deer in headlights in big fights again. And he just, he just, you know, he can't seem to do it. And Connor fans got upset like I was taken away from Connor. The shots that hit Cowboy early, he slipped a left hand and got hit with Cowboy's, with, with uh, Connor's thigh. Not the knee, the thigh. Boom, that hit him. He was in clinch position and got hit with a couple of shoulder strikes. And when they broke, he looked beat up and defeated. So had that left hand had landed, boom, and he's rocked. And okay, that left hand looked like it would knock out just about anybody. The combination of strikes that Cowboy was hit with was a thigh and shoulder strikes. Can you get hurt by shoulder strikes? Apparently you can. I don't think I've ever seen it before. People use shoulder strikes. They're, they're just kind of, you know, in the clinch positions and they they give you a black eye or they, they make you uncomfortable. Foot stomps. I, I've never seen anyone go, whoa, from shoulder strikes. Now, did Connor practice these and he landed the most amazing shoulder strikes ever? Maybe. Once again, that's how much credit you want to give Connor. How much, you know, how much criticism do you want to give Cowboy? It's, that's the scale. I've never seen anyone really... I won't say rocked or, you know, by shoulder strike. I've never seen that before. So he got hit with these shots and then he backed off. His his eye was swollen and his nose started bleeding. I went, it's done. It's done. Connor hasn't even landed a punch and it's done. And it was. He just went after him and, and, and finished him. Head kick. I mean, the idea that that, that combination or sequence, is a better way to put it, of strikes backed off Cowboy, and Cowboy didn't go, ah, screw it, and and throw a combination or something at Connor once they were at distance. My, my eyes starting to swell up. Oh, man, it's, it, it's time to rock and roll, and, and we never saw that button get pushed. 
So once again, it's a matter of opinion whether it was a really bad night for Cowboy, really great night for McGregor. Where you fall in the middle of that and how much praise and blame you want to give is a matter of opinion. Connor looked great. Cowboy looked bad. Did Connor's greatness make Cowboy look bad? I would normally say yes in an instance like this, like with Jose Aldo, except Cowboy has a tendency to do this. RDA walked right through him. You know, it's it's, it's he's been in this situation before and not been able to pull the trigger and, and guys have blown away who didn't have Connor's speed, who didn't have Connor's accuracy. RDA can punch. Take nothing away from that guy, especially 55, Jesus. But he doesn't have Connor's speed and accuracy. I don't think anybody does. So the problem is Cowboy looked like the worst version of Cowboy. Connor looked like the best version of Connor. And that when you put those two things together, it's over. So moving forward, after the... Uh, and also, by the way, as I was saying in the beginning uh, about pay-per-view time and all this stuff, that's why you see varying levels of post-fight analysis at the desk. Because they have to go to a certain time. So after the fight, hey, Joe, what do you think of this? Hey, Paul Felder, what do you think of the future? It's because they got to fill till the end. So that's why sometimes Joe will interview the fighter. John Anik will go to the rollout, which is the credits or the and the, the a highlight of the night. Hey, I'm John Anik. Thank you for joining us, UFC 246. We'll see you in wherever later on. That, I mean, that's called a rollout. And so sometimes they'll go straight to the rollout. If it's after 1 o'clock Eastern, 10 o'clock Pacific, they'll just go right to the rollout. We're out of here. But if it's, you know, 10 minutes to one, we got to go to one. Hey, Joe, what you, and they'll sit at the desk. They know most people have turned off their televisions already, but they have to fill time until that point. That's why you see sometimes they talk at the desk, sometimes they don't. It's about how much time's left. Anyway, so post fight, Dana White at the press conference said Khabib is the fight to make. It has a lot of international appeal. It would sell. Blah, blah, blah. Khabib. I was kind of surprised by that, to be honest with you. Because this fight didn't go long enough for us to see... Sorry about my eyes. I got to bed late last night. Um, this fight didn't go long enough for us to see the skill set that will help him against Khabib. The skill set that will help him against Kamaru Usman. He didn't stop a takedown. It didn't go to the ground. He didn't have to get out of a submission. He didn't have to transition. Or didn't have to show us his guard work. He didn't have to show us anything that he's going to need against Khabib. Right? Against a big physical wrestler, he's going to need a different skill set than fast, crisp punches. His punches look great. I can't take away anything from that. And he looked powerful. But we just didn't see, wow, he's really added this jujitsu stuff for this takedown defense. And wow, that'll really help him against Khabib. We didn't get a chance to see that. So, putting him against the guy who's the worst style matchup for him at 155 pounds. I think there were worst matchups at 170, because I think they basically fight like Khabib, except they're bigger. Uh, the idea that Dana would throw him from this fight to the worst style matchup possible. I was a little surprised by that. I think the BMF fight with Masvidal is a better style matchup for uh, Connor. He showed tonight anybody in the world who stands with him, even, you know... I don't know about a natural 170, but a decent size 170. He can crack and knock you out. So, to me, the fight with Masvidal, to me, to me, to me seems like a no-brainer. It's big money. It's stylistically really good. Masvidal is red hot right now. And he might not stay there. Meaning, he's lost plenty of fights in the UFC before. He might go on a losing streak and, and not be so hot anymore. So, it's, it's red hot and it's kind of temporary. I think Khabib or the 155-pound champion, no disrespect to Ferguson, he might win, is going to be there at the end. Even if he loses this BMF fight at 170, yeah, it's at 170. Sure, he can get a title for 55. Of course, I mean, it's easy to do. Whether you not, whether or not you believe it's justified, it's the big money fight. They're going to make it. So, um, I'm kind of surprised that they would throw him back with Khabib, who style-wise just doesn't pre present a good style matchup for Conor. And we didn't see anything in this fight that made me think, boy, he's really going to stop Khabib's takedown. I mean, he never even went there. And with the Masvidal fight looming right here, right now, great style matchup. Connor didn't get hurt. Neither guy has a fight coming right now. Obviously, uh, Ferguson has to fight Khabib, so he's on the shelf. I don't know why they don't make it right now. Why would they make Connor wait that long between Khabib and uh, Tony? And then who knows what happens? Khabib might get hurt, or it's a long fight. He gets a six month suspension or something. And not six months, it's usually like 90 days, but whatever. It takes him a while to heal. He can't fight again for a while. Who knows? 
I would strike while the iron's hot with the the um, the monster all fight right now. We'll have to see. But appreciate you guys and gals. I uh, hope you enjoy, and I'll be back before and after the next one.